Okay, very good morning to you. It is Tuesday the 1st of September. I hope everyone in the UK had an excellent long weekend, but straight back into the fold and going to update you with a variety of news stories actually. Quite a bit for me to get you up to speed on, but before I do, let's have a bit, a bit of a stock check on where exactly did we end in August, because August was a phenomenal month by performance. So looking at a few different things here, um, essentially yesterday was a little bit mixed, um, but we did see some outperformance once again in the NASDAQ 100. Um, Apple surged after their stock split 4 to 1, lifted the NASDAQ 100 past 12,000 for the first time. Um, we'll have a look at Apple and its new weighting as far as it's comprised now in the Dow in second because it could be quite useful going forward to understand then uh, the slight divergence that we had yesterday. The Dow and the S&P were lower, big outperformance in the NASDAQ and it could well be amplified now uh, in regard to the new mix and blend of companies within the Dow index. Um, otherwise though, looking at some of the stock performance, so here the S&P 500 now has posted its longest monthly winning streak since 2018. It was the best August performance in US equities for 34 years. Uh, so definitely the, the show goes on, as they say, for, for the time being. Um, the Dow did lag though a little bit yesterday, not only because of the outperformance in the likes of Apple, which was up, I think, in excess of 3% by the close. Tesla was also rallying sharply following its own stock split. But the Dow lagged um, with Microsoft and Walmart slumping on concerns China could block the possible sale of the video app TikTok. And if you remember, that was elevating in, in individually their stock prices at the end of last week. Um, looking at the new Dow sorted by percentage weight within the index uh, it's always worth familiarizing yourself with this in order to understand then index overall movement and so the actual the biggest company now by percentage is united health group uh, they account now for just over seven percent of the entire index followed by top three home depot and actually the new entrant uh, or both or two actually sales gen uh, and sales gen sales force and amgen uh, two of the new additions to the actual index, they are now taking the third and fourth spot. Microsoft is fifth. And if you actually look at Apple now, they were previously around 12% or so of the Dow. They've now dropped all the way down to 17th slot, and they now account for just around 3%. Um, have had quite a few questions, uh, particularly yesterday. I was away from the desk, but a number of people uh, who understandably are new to markets and maybe not so familiar with the concept of stock splits. You know, so why do they do it in regards to helping boost a, a stock's liquidity profile in order to help uh, other, uh, other investors within the marketplace become stock or shareholders given then it kind of devalues, if you like, the singular price. So it gives it more of an opportunity for new entrants to buy that stock. Uh, particularly with companies like Apple and Tesla, which have grown so excessively more expensive over time. And it's not the first time these sorts of things have happened. I think it was back in 2014, Apple did a stock split uh, as well. But rather than me going into this in greater detail, what I'm going to do is I'm going to post a link uh, in the description or comments of this video uh, and just have a read of this. Um, anyone who is new to markets, and you would have heard me say this to you before, uh, if we have interacted, you know, Investopedia really should be your your Bible. Uh, and my, my general rule of thumb to anyone new to markets is always be constantly uh, kind of curious. Uh, and if you ever see anything during the day that you're unsure of, then take it upon yourself to really uh, investigate. And a really great place or tool for doing that is Investopedia because it's really short form, concise. It gives you a nice example, key takeaways. Uh, and then generally build up these knowledge blocks over time and you can accumulate a good level of knowledge quite quickly. So I'm not going to go into this in great detail. I'll let you check that out in your own time. Um, but following on the, the stock's performance, um, one thing to also be aware of, uh, particularly talking about Apple, obviously still uh, a major force for markets at the moment. Um, interesting on Bloomberg, they were saying that uh, according to suppliers, Apple's preparing 75 million 5G iPhones alongside new watches and iPads uh, and this comes ahead of course their, their general timed unveiling of new products that we're going to be seeing uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, but this is particularly interesting just given the context of the pandemic of course hasn't really dented their ambitions to continue roughly in line with as the article says here with last year's launch. 
So despite everything that's gone on, the company's still ploughing on with the same kind of volume of numbers, uh, which is particularly important for this, this stock to continue in the trends that it has been seeing. Uh, another company as well, probably worth a shout, uh, is Zoom. Uh, obviously, Zoom being a massive beneficiary of the pandemic situation and the whole working from home um, and their shares were up at around 25% after market last night. Uh, they smashed even the most optimistic of estimates on the street. Uh, so those types of names continue to sharply uh, outperform the market. Um, but yeah, quick quick look then. That's kind of the general overview of, of a lot of what was happening yesterday. But at the moment, um, you can see stock indices still positive footing. Uh, the Nasdaq future in the center here, um, just above where it was in the high from yesterday evening's close on Wall Street. And you can see here just finding a little bit of resistance, the Asia Pacific session high and around the uh, respective R1. Um, DAX up about 81 in the currency markets. The Dixie is down firmly. Uh, Dixie took a bit of a hit in the overnight session. Um, we did have some comments out of Clarida, who is the vice chair of the Federal Reserve yesterday. Now, these comments did come out yesterday, but I am mindful that quite a few of you are not around, particularly if you're based in the UK, to be looking at your screen. So just a quick update. What did Clarida say? Uh, and again, Clarida is the vice chair, so is a particularly important person aligned then uh, as close as you can be to Jerome Powell and left open the possibility of, the, the possibility of employing treasury yield caps at some point in the future. Now, I did go on to indicate it's not likely now um, in terms of timing and also reiterated the bank's rejection of negative rates, but kept yield curve control basically on firmly on the table. And this, of course, comes after that move towards average inflation targeting we saw just last week. So um, likelihood that just further fuels that narrative. The Fed are here to remain the supportive hand of markets and keeping that option on the table. Uh, I guess that for me is somewhat tactical. I'm not that surprised by it because after you take a dovish change in policy is like what we saw uh, last week, the, the market would probably want some type of reassurance that that's not just it, that there are still other options. Not that it's necessary right now, we're not seeing any degree of market disruption, but to know with assurance that the Fed is still there to, to prop things up. And I think that's what the, the Fed strategy in their communication was trying to do with Carida's comments. But nonetheless, uh, the Dixie overnight uh, has come under some pressure um, and the Dixie is trading down about um, three quarters of 1%, so it's down um, a decent amount. And that means that in the major pairs, um, we are close to the 120 handle now in the Euro and also in the British pound, we're up at uh, the 134 handle. Now, one thing I just quickly wanted to show you was, okay, let's have a look at the the dollar index. I know this is a bit tricky to see. Let me see if I can move it up a little bit. So there you go. So looking at the access at the bottom here, I mean, this is going back to the mid 90s on the far left. Uh, but if we go back to the um, where we are right now, which is trading, uh, we have traded under 92. And it seems like the break of 92, which was the um, a level of which symbolically we bounced off in the Dixie yesterday. So if I can put my cursor um, sort of kind of around this sort of level here on the on the shorter dated chart on the Dixie, we hit that level uh, and we got rejected. We bounced quite higher, but the break through that overnight has uh, exacerbated almost some of the weakness in the greenback. And if we look where we are at the moment, you can see we're right back at around that low that we had in May of 2016. Also as well, a point of interest in the summer of 2017 and that reference high that we had back in 2004 and 2005. So some quite key levels here technically. Obviously the dollar has taken an almighty hit in recent times and that trend has continued despite that brief hiatus that we saw in the selling after that momentary uh, kind of yield movement shock that, that created a little bit of that gold shakeout um, that happened a few weeks ago. That's all seemingly a bit of a distant memory now. And if you're looking at gold, back to the charts for one moment, gold is now uh, having a bit of a test and a move back to the upside. So it's kind of normal service resuming to some degree. And we're right back up where we found some resistance at the moment uh, at the R2 on the daily pivots, but we're just shy of the 2000 level. Uh, and of course, if we look at the 2000 level over the course of the 
um, this whole kind of story of gold over the elevated price movement that we had through late part of July 2000 obviously has been an area here of uh, of significance where we were rejected a number of times before we had the breakout that came at the beginning of August so we're right back up there uh, again as far as uh, gold is concerned uh, again chiefly buoyed by the um, weakening and persistent weakness in the dollar uh, the other thing is though talking about the dollar is obviously these currency pairs and just taking a shift over to the currency market uh, this is that um, euro dollar chart we've been looking at for quite a while and obviously now we've firmly broken through that long-term trend line we've had our eyes on for quite some time and that has opened the door to around the 12050 looking on the uh, weekly candlesticks here uh, but you can see then somewhat inevitable this kind of grind back up higher for the euro and also helping a little bit with the euro is this divergence in fundamentals not only have we got a persistent weakening dollar but you know, in Germany, headlines like this further support the kind of narrative for that move. Uh, this is talking about um, in Germany, the government today is going to unveil an update to their, their latest growth forecasts. They issued these back in April and they expect that the economic fallout from coronavirus will be smaller than expected this year. According to people familiar with the matter ahead of the official unveiling of these latest forecasts will get. Um, I think it's around 10 a.m. London time. Um, the idea here being then that previously they predicted back in April. So if you remember, April was right in the depths of the actual full nationwide lockdowns experienced globally at that time. So it's probably the maximum point of pessimism you probably could have had at uh, that particular uh, time. So I don't find it that surprising that perhaps now with a bit more clearer visibility and that the fiscal and monetary responses are now well known and the market has recovered that things are probably going to become still deep contractions for the end of this year but perhaps not as bad as we previously forecasted as a reference point back in april they predicted the german economy would contract by around 6.3 percent and we're looking up for revision to perhaps just a contraction of six percent for example uh, but i'm not saying that's the, the the silver bullet for the euro but it definitely helps that idea that helps push euro and you can see here just looking on the slightly shorter dated uh, chart we've broken above uh, the levels that we were trading in around the middle of the month if I quickly just transition my screen back uh, so here on the left hand side that was the high printed on the 18th and we got re rejected close to that price point in yesterday afternoon session uh, and that's probably going to act as, a, as an area now of support for the time being which is also uh, coinciding with around the uh, R1 on the daily pivots obviously as uh, the dollar weakens cable continues to benefit um, cable now just looking at this chart here um, reclaiming the 134 handle which puts us right away back up to where we were in December of 2019 you know, we're at the best levels clearly year to date that we've had and it does come irrespective of the these types of comments so the EU chief Brexit negotiator Michel Barnier has said in the Telegraph that is unwilling to open discussions of Britain's latest fisheries proposal until the UK budgets uh, budges on other issues. So we continue to remain at a the distinct impasse here in these Brexit talks. And as I've said before, through those timelines that I shared last week, I really don't see yet any type of visible breakthrough or compromise happening right now, even though you know, the clock is ticking and time is is diminishing in regards to get some sort of soft tentative deal by the 2nd of October in order for it to be ratified by the end of the year, the end of the transition period. So yes, this sounds um, pretty frightening concept for the, the kind of success of those negotiations, but I wouldn't expect anything else given the amount of time that they still have to debate such issues. So I wouldn't read too much into that in the moment. As I've said before, I continue to say at this point, I think cable's driven by other forces, i.e. the dollar for the time being is more of a potent force. Um, talking of FX, probably prudent then to also get the Aussie involved because we did have the RBA um, overnight. So just jumping around some different headlines here. So firstly, what did they do with their interest rate decision? Well, I didn't really see any reaction because everything was as expected. So they left interest rates in their three year um, kind of yield target unchanged. So no shocks there. But we did have overnight uh, in Australia, uh, the generally the currency supported by a couple of different things, uh, better than expected building approvals and current account data coming out of Australia. 
but also we did have in China uh, this. So in China overnight, we had some information where um, China's factory activity expanded at the fastest clip um, since, or well, in nearly a decade, basically, uh, in the month of August. 53.1 was the number above expectations of 52.6. It was bolstered by the first increase in new export orders uh, this year. So overnight, the currency markets again, uh, due to this figure, but also the dollar weakness, the Chinese yuan actually traded at its highest level since uh, 2019. Uh, but also, as given the importance of the Chinese economic story for then supportive of general trade uh, and the demand of goods from Australia from an import basis, that's also a good story for the Aussie. And so the Aussie just tra tracking a little higher in the overnight session. And I was looking at the Aussie yesterday because uh, I put out a briefing on Sunday night and I was talking about now that we had broken this long-term trend line dating back to 2014, um, that I'd be keeping an eye on the 74 handle uh, as the first point of target, which was that high that we had back in the end of December of 2018. And here we are right at that level. So it was quite interesting yesterday, actually. We basically hit that 74, and then you can see we got rejected, and people would have been just booking profit on that trade on the basis of that long-term uh, trend line. So, yeah, quite a nice trade. I know the people who were in the market, some of you got hold of a little bit of that. Um, riding the price move up during yesterday's session uh, and then just looking to bail on that position as per I think a lot of people looking at the same thing and it faded uh, during the latter hours of yesterday's session only to be bid again for those reasons just mentioned Chinese solid data persistent dollar weakness and some decent Aussie numbers as well just helping push things back up again uh, in the overnight session but sticking within that FX region Let's get the yen involved because last time I probably spoke to you guys, we were talking about uh, the somewhat surprise resignation of um, the Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe. So what's the latest here? Well, the latest articles are suggesting that top government spokesman uh, Yoshihide Suga is emerging as a front runner to become next premier, heightening the chance then what that candidate uh, symbolizes the chance that the government will continue down the policy course set by Abe, which importantly is an Abenomics, which is those three arrows of unprecedented amounts of fiscal um, and monetary stimulus at the core of it. And so we saw this big sell off, obviously, which was concerns at the end of last week about what his resignation might mean for the fate of that particular strategy for the country. Uh, and that was causing a strengthening play for the currency and Japanese yen. However, continuity of some case, kind of Abenomics 2.0, if you like, uh, would help, you would think, stabilize this price, not necessarily reverse course completely, but at least eradicate the kind of pressure then uh, for any continuation of just basically uh, any further uh, kind of downside at this point. Oh, excuse me, let's just remove this. Um, in regard to um, moves towards this sort of direction, if I was to look at the, the currency chart here. So yeah, this was the, the move that we had at the end of last week. Um, basically, it's just about Xing out this, this potential now, um, which is the risk that we could have seen a longer term play where you know, a key area of 104, looking here on a, a much longer weekly um, candlestick chart where that 104 would be a, a key downside level on the idea of the eradication or let's say severe watering down of Abenomics would have meant for uh, dollar yen as a pair. But if this candidate continues to break away as the front runner uh, in the form of the, the top government spokesman Suga, then what you would expect then is perhaps some stabilization of the currency pair rather than a push down as this arrow would indicate would be my interpretation to take from that uh, at the moment. But we continue to monitor, still fairly early, and there's a lot of candidates still jostling for political positioning at the moment, I would say, so so perhaps one to continue to watch. Um, okay, yeah, jumping back, a few other um, final articles just to, to mention. One of the things was this. Quite an interesting note came out on Monday from analysts at JP Morgan talking about the US election. Uh, and uh, they said investors should position for the rising odds of Donald Trump winning re-election. Betting odds uh, are now even, um, generally speaking, irrespective of the fact that Biden still leads in the polls. 
Um, and what JP is saying that the reasoning, the rationale here quite simply is largely due to the impact of public opinion of violence around protests uh, as well as uh, potential bias in polls. So you remember we've had a number of protests. I think there was one latest one in Portland following a shooting where pro-Trump and Black Lives Matter movement protesters um, clashed uh, in large scale in Portland, in, in Washington, in, in the US on the weekend. So this continues to be a recurring theme. Uh, and a couple of things here from JP Morgan, what they're saying to, to further this. They said, based on past research, there could be a shift of five to ten points in polls from Democrats to Republicans if the perception of protests turns from peaceful to violent. Um, also, the outcome of any debates and the Democrats' stance on protests will be key. Uh, the latter risks turning off voters generally if seen as too uh, permissive, but also could alienate progressives if it's seen if it's not seen as sympathetic enough. So, basically. A key point here is that COVID in the US, generally speaking, although uh, obviously we've got this period of seasonality to come, uh, if that coincides then with schools reopening, does that act as a potential catalyst then for another wave in the US? You know, who knows at this point? But if COVID continues to remain on general controlled point, uh, uh, well, for this time at least, if that situation improves with COVID, if the narrative changes more to these protests, uh, it's going to be particularly difficult for Biden to manage to appease both sides of the political spectrum that he's trying to capture for the vote. And for Trump, then, it takes away one of the biggest negatives, which has been his handling of COVID, and puts things square and center on this, this tried and tested US political formula that has shown success through presidential campaigns in history, which is law and order. And the more these violent these protests become, I would see the more positively and this plays in favour of Donald Trump's likelihood of him improving in the polls. Um, following on from the conventions, some of these other clashes that we've had with the site improvements with COVID, um, actually the polls have been um, narrowing and actually Biden's lead, which if you remember was as much as plus 10 earlier a few weeks ago, is now just plus 6.2. And you can see here this red line is Trump, whereas Biden's remained relatively static. Trump really has started to make some, some decent headway uh, since really the Republican convention. Uh, since that began post-period and with more violence that's been seen, actually the more it's moved higher. There's some interesting graphics actually um, from the FT this morning. I haven't got them to hand. And it shows you where people who are indifferent, so neither Republican or Democratic um, minded, and how they feel about things like the Black Lives Matter movement. And actually, the, the kind of momentum behind that for someone who's not engaged in that traditionally as a subject matter um, has started to dissipate fairly sharply, actually. So and that in itself also plays into the hands of, uh, of Donald Trump. So, yeah, I as I've always been and, you know, don't take this as my political biases, but I still, just based on the facts, I still firmly believe that Donald Trump will win uh, a second term at this point, is my take. Um, final story, I thought it was just worth a mention, just to not confuse you in case you see this headline, you think it's a negative, because I'll tell you now it's not, and I'll explain why. And that's because there's a Sanofi and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals have come out overnight and they are suspending tests on using their rheumatoid arthritis medicine as a potential weapon against COVID-19 after weak results in a final trial of clinical trials. Now, although this sounds quite bad on the headline, it's kind of like, wow, these are big pharmaceutical companies and perhaps this was the, uh, the magical formula that was going to be adopted for the rolling out of a solution for COVID-19. The fact of the matter is that the CEO of, I think it was Sanofi, had already stated that this actual trial was seen as a particular long shot. And so the actual credibility behind it and therefore net the expectation of it being successful was already very low. So the fact that they've come out and actually the final clinical trials have proven that point is not a surprise at all. So I would not take this as a negative headline uh, in that extent. Um, and that that's pretty much it from a new side of things so yeah plenty to digest I hope it all kind of made sense actually before I just quickly jump to the calendar I just want to quickly mention crude oil um, because I didn't mention that on Sunday but one of the main things here I've been looking for updates I'm sure more will come today 
But generally speaking, the things I was reading at the weekend were suggesting that overall, the impact then from Hurricane Laura was to a much lesser degree than perhaps people were fearing initially. So we'd be looking for a reacceleration, the reopening of those various facilities within the Gulf um, to, to come back online pretty quickly. And so we have seen some, some fairly volatile price movement in oil. Um, in yesterday's session, I can see we did drop a decent amount before finding a bit of support. We're trading a 43 handle back up 50 cents for the moment. Um, on, a, on a daily continuation though, some fairly interesting price action. Uh, I've been keeping an eye really over the last few weeks on the 21 DMA. Generally has been a, a pretty good line of support for price, generally speaking. And also then with the low that we had back on the 27th of August coinciding around a similar point, that would be 42.36. So on a slightly higher time frame, I'd be looking at these areas as, as a pretty decent uh, area of support for price. Uh, but things would suggest now, you know, you've had the Chinese data overnight um, that, that, was, that was strong in terms of their manufacturing activity. Um, in fact, that grew at the fastest pace in, in about a decade. You've also got COVID. Yes, there are areas like India, I understand, which are still particularly bad, but overall in places like the US, it's still relatively controlled. Uh, equity sentiment still continue to push higher. And so overall, I would say I still favor that oil should continue to track higher. Uh, technically speaking, I think we do need to really break through this 43.32, that 2nd of March high. We, we flirted with it a couple of times, never really confirmed a break, but I think once we do, and I do think it's a matter of time when we do, then we'll see a decent push up to 45 and fairly quick succession. Not saying that's gonna to happen today, but uh, I think that's definitely um, the price movement that I'd expect over the, the coming days. Okay, um, calendar wise for today, what have we got? Um, moving on to the European morning, these are generally final uh, manufacturing PMI numbers that we'll get. So we're not expecting too much market reaction to it. You do get though the German unemployment change and rate coming out just before 9 a.m. London time. So keep an eye out for that. Um, going into then the UK uh, manufacturing PMI, again, final reading for August, that's coming out at 9.30 alongside mortgage approvals and lending. You do get the Eurozone flash CPI reading for August. Uh, coming out at 10 o'clock. So yeah, a couple of things European related to, to keep an eye on that German job data and the, the flash CPI numbers coming out of the Eurozone at 10 a.m. Uh, that'll come, come out alongside the Eurozone unemployment rate. This afternoon, again, final manufacturing activity number for the US, and then you get ISM manufacturing, much more important for the session. That'll be at three o'clock. Those numbers still expected to hold up. You might have caught me on Sunday talking about how Credit Suisse analysts were talking about potential deterioration further into the fall, but for the moment, I'd anticipate that these numbers should be fairly robust still. Still, uh, Again, you've got the manufacturing Tuesday, non-manufacturing is coming Thursday as far as the ISM US figures are concerned. Uh, Beige Book would be expected too much of a great deal out of that. Uh, and then you've got the API inventories, of course, coming later on this evening. From a speaker's perspective, um, ECB, De Guindos and Lane speaking morning and afternoon, and then Fed's uh, Brainard, who is speaking actually on topic in regards to the recent change in Fed policy. And uh, she is a governor, and she's gonna be speaking at 6 p.m. London, so that'd be one o'clock in the afternoon if you're based in New York. All right, I think that's a, a long enough briefing. Sorry for the, for the length, but quite a few to get back up to speed, and welcome back if you're in the UK, uh, back into the fold. Uh, any questions at all, uh, just feel free to drop me a comment. And yeah, any information about stock splits and what does that mean, I'll drop that link for you to have a read as well in the video. But have a great day ahead. Thanks very much.